Welcome to the Baltimore Museum of Art. I'm so pleased to be your host today. My name is Brittany Liberta, and I'm the new Assistant Curator of Decorative Arts here at the BMA. Right now, the museum is currently closed due to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we do have time tickets that are available for our special exhibitions, and hopefully in the upcoming weeks and months, we'll be able to reopen some of our galleries. What this does give us the opportunity to do, though, is have a private tour, a special one-on-one -on -one experience for you, hopefully warm at home this winter in your couch, uh, to see objects which you may not have seen ever before, which you may not have seen in a long time, um, and things like the installation behind me, which are temporary uh, to the BMA. I wanted to start here today because we're in the East Lobby. And in 2019, the BMA started something called the Meyerhoff Becker Commission for Contemporary Artists. The invitation is given to contemporary artists from diverse audiences to create some form of new environment in our lobby. Michelin Thomas has redone everything from the vinyl floor below me <laughs> Uh, to these um, abstract wooden banisters here over our glass balustrade, to large vinyl photo collages um, over uh, what are previously white walls, and then vignettes which illustrate, in this case, the living room of, in Thomas's sort of viewpoint and vision, an African American home from the 70s or 80s. Thomas's approach to this installation uh, was multifaceted, and one main element was to create an interior, to create a home space, to create a residence inside the museum institution, um, which we know by now and should be in full conversation with as a culture, um, has had a background based in largely white, largely Christian, uh, or Jewish populations founding institutions and then donating their collections. Thomas is here creating a home space, a residential space inside the museum institution for a much broader audience. And I think uh, in addition to having a whole lot of verb and uh, certainly a color palette that uh, should inspire us to rethink the spectrum of colors uh, that we have in our homes and uh, appreciate in our lives, um, on this wintry day, Thomas is also asking a lot of questions that we're currently asking at the BMA about the decorative arts and design collection. So today we'll look at topics like, where is this from? What have we attributed this to in the past? Does that tell the whole story? What stories aren't we telling about objects? What's the original context of the object? Who contributed to the making of it? Um, and most provocatively, perhaps, whose home do we have on view? Whose narrative is here? And how can we change that? So I'm joined today by Carrie Grief from the Decorative Arts Trust, and uh, she'll be filming a sort of walking and talking tour as I give you a look at what the museum is displaying currently and some ideas about where we might go in the future. We're entering now the Jacobs Wing, which is a wing of the museum which houses the early European collection. The decorative arts collection at the BMA begins around 1250, with small gold objects with enameling uh, used for reliquaries um, in a Christian context uh, in Europe by European makers. So around 1250 AD, our then collection of decorative arts goes all the way up through the present to global contemporary design. It's a circa 800 year spread of functional objects that are made by craftspeople of um, multiple, gender, multiple nationalities, multiple genders and identifications, um, and objects which combine bodies of people from across the world. So here in this display, uh, put together by one of my predecessors, um, and some colleagues in the sculpture department. We have medieval to Renaissance objects that depict things like um, 
hard stones uh, that are crafted into uh, feast, feast cups. We have a uh, Persian uh, tin glazed earthenware that's in our non-Western collection at the BMA that depicts a ship illustrating global trade uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries. And that leads us to this object that I want to focus on in our early European collection. What we're looking at is a representation of Christ. This is made for the Catholic faith. He's hanging on the cross. Um, if you are familiar with the Christian tradition, this is the crucifixion of Christ. Um, and if we zoom right into that gold, we can see a sort of fantastically modeled uh, abdomen, uh, an S-curve on the well-articulated kneecaps, um, and uh, a delicacy to each of the fingers at the top. Christ is nailed here, uh, rendered in gold, to a rock crystal cross on the background. Um, and uh, if you zoom down a little bit, Carrie, you can see a rock crystal base uh, that holds up the cross, um, and then four carved rock crystal lions on the bottom. There's also enamel over gold uh, that's used to mount and decorate the edges of this object. Previously, the BMA listed this work as Portuguese, 17th century. Crucifix, rock crystal, gold, and enamel. One of the interesting conversations I've had with visiting scholars since starting at the BMA about two years ago is about not just the Portuguese, perhaps, goldsmiths crafting, casting, and then chasing and modeling of Christ, but the source material for this Catholic object. The rock crystal is very likely from Sri Lanka. The Portuguese had colonized Sri Lanka, established trade, and then colonized Sri Lanka beginning in 1505. So while we call this work Portuguese, what we're actually looking at is probably a Sri Lankan craftsman who's chiseled into a piece of rock crystal and then either sent that preformed rock crystal cross and base to Portugal for a Portuguese goldsmith who has gotten his gold from perhaps North African trade, perhaps the New World, um, and he's, uh, he's brought together these these materials from various continents into one object in front of us. So without even moving this object, without creating a new installation, without having a special exhibition, um, with, with in fact just a kind of minor change, which is going to our tombstone and the information that we're presenting to the world, we can change this object from just being a European work to now being a Sri Lankan work with a Portuguese work uh, artists and Portuguese craftsmanship, um, and even we can move further into thinking about potential material sources in a label. So that's some of the work that for me, our early European collection is going to do more and more of in the future. Let's walk this way slowly through the galleries. I hope it's an enjoyable sort of revisit for you if you haven't been to a museum in quite a while. I hope you're enjoying seeing some of your old favorites again. Um, and uh, I do apologize if anything is covered. We have light sensitive material that we are, uh, light sensitive material that we're protecting uh, at the DNA until we're open to the public. We want you all to be able to see things for as long as possible. Um, and so, as we're walking through this gallery, we enter into our 18th century European portraiture space. Late 17th, early 19th, I should say. Uh, European portraiture gallery, where we have Dutch, English, uh, Scottish, and French painters. Um, one part of the collection, which we can only see a fraction of on view right now, are our stuff boxes and necessaire from the 18th century. Um, the origins of these works vary from German craftsmen uh, to French to English um, and probably more as well. Um, craftsmen that are working on these small precious objects made of enamels, hard stones, and various types of 
marbles or things like lapis lazuli, um, porcelains, and of course diamonds. Um, I always go back to saying, as we talked about with the previous work, that these are composite pieces. While the assembler, and the, who's most often given the attribution for creating the final work, right now we can go back all the way to the extraction histories of where these materials came from in order to tell a fuller story. And then, of course, when we're thinking about snuff, we can think about tobacco. And in the 18th century, tobacco here in Maryland was one of the main products that we were shipping out across the world. So as we revisit and examine our stories we're telling in our European collection, I'm hoping to bring more and more connections between these, these um, containers for various uh, natural products um, through their trade routes back to the place we're currently standing today. If you want to move forward with me, Carrie, we'll, we'll keep giving our art tour. Um, I'm enjoying right now, uh, although we're off site often during the pandemic, uh, that's given us more and more opportunities to collaborate. So I'm working with the European painting curators right now at looking at some of our sitters in our portraits. And we're able to identify where the, where the sitter lived um, in the case of uh, several of our English aristocrats. We can then look at the inventories of the house to know what they owned, but also to the history of the accu accumulation of wealth. Um, which leads us, more often than not in the 18th century, to a history of colonization. Um, and through this look into the centers of our paintings, I'm hoping to continue in the future expanding the objects uh, around the paintings so we can get a fuller picture of wealth sources, and that will give us a picture of who is contributing to the both the, the wealth that paid for the painting, um, but also to the, a much more holistic display of the 18th century world. Uh, right now we're in Fox Court and our lighting has changed uh, sort of beautifully uh, for us. When you come to the BMA, usually just for your orientation, you'll head to the right here to see our special exhibitions, or you'll enter right through that Meyerhoff Becker Commission East Lobby entrance that we were at. Um, but today, this central court houses our Antioch mosaics too. And if we're on a long tour of residences uh, in, in the world today, we can think about these Antioch floors. Uh, so if we're around uh, present day Turkey uh, and Syria, we can think of the, uh, these floors as being the foundations of perhaps where we find figuration. <laughs> uh, Oh, and it's making me wish we had carpets on view <laughs> to look at. We keep on being with you, Carrie. So we're leaving now a um, European wing in which we just stopped at a few objects because several of the galleries are being reinstalled um, in part. So do come back and we'll give you, um, be more than happy to give anyone uh, a tour of those spaces. Um, we'll look at some of our newly reconfigured galleries here in the American wing and also some objects which have been um, inspiration for my research in the past year and a half. So this is Fox Court. We're entering the John Russell Pope uh, building, which was opened, I believe, in 1929. It is the first uh, dedicated uh, purpose-built museum uh, building. And today, it houses just the American wing. Uh, so that means for us, works created in generally the North American continent. Um, generally the North American continent, and they can include American painting and sculpture, American decorative arts, and Native American works of art, um, which are slowly being added to the galleries over time. So come with me this way. We'll start right at the chain transition uh, from colonial America to a more global Maryland. Welcome to one of the first galleries in our American Wing. 
Uh, this gallery is dedicated to Maryland, the Chesapeake Bay, and American makers in the period just after the American Revolution where Americans were asserting themselves as a new continent um, and entering for their own profits uh, global trade. Some of my favorite objects in this room are, for example, this Boston made high chest um, on oh, very nice cabriole legs uh, that was produced in Boston by William Randall and Robert Davis. Those are the Japanners. The Japanners are the people creating this gessoed and then modeled and painted surface, which is an imitation of Japanese lacquer. Think about that for a second. We're here in the 1730s. We're here in colonial America. And we have furniture makers, which are crafting works in imitation of Japanese furniture. Japanese lacquering can be uh, produced in multiple different ways, but traditional Japanese lacquer furniture is actually from the sap of trees being layered and set, let to dry, layered and let to dry over months, if not years, before the lacquer is then carved into to create a three-dimensional surface. The process in America is different. Here, we're a, it's a building up as opposed to a subtractive creation of the figuration. Um, and we can see that the Japaners have chosen different vignetted scenes, florals, architecture, a rooster here, um, dogs. <laughs> um, and uh, they've created a kind of uh, mystical and whimsical combination of uh, figures from a, a non-existent landscape. These are very rare. Uh, in the US, and I encourage you to come and look at this closely. Uh, it also marks for our American collection one of the earliest pieces of furniture, uh, which is made in a William and Mary style, which also gestures towards early Americans, colonial Americans, looking uh, to English furniture, and in fact often importing English furniture um, prior to the revolution. On the left, next to this, we have another work which helps explain broader America. This is a recent acquisition. Uh, it's a silver tray from Potosi, uh, which is a city, a mining city uh, in present day Bolivia. But when this work was created in 1725 to 1750, uh, Bolivia was under uh, Spanish colonial control. And so here we're looking at a work made under colonial rule, much like our Japan's chest on the left, um, and for potentially one of the uh, aristocrats living and working in Potosi. I was particularly excited about what this work could do for us in thinking about combinations of secular and religious pieces. So at the very center, we were just looking at an image of uh, the stigmata, the crown of thorns of Christ, and then four, the four holes where uh, the stakes were put into Christ's body and the wound from the spear in the center, a Catholic central uh, set of motifs for this work. But if we look on the outsides of it, we can see blousey flowers, probably cultivated in a hothouse and then cut, uh, very much a European tradition of flower cultivation originating in the 17th century or popularized in the 17th into the 18th century. And then on the outside, in this band around here, we can see four guitar players, very likely court guitar players in the town of Potosi, um, which at the point of 1725 was a wealthy colonial city. That's because Potosi was home to a gigantic mountain, uh, which was a silver mine. The silver mine in Potosi was, the lar was a large draw, the large reason why the Spanish uh, conquerors uh, and uh, enslavers uh, entered this part of the region. Uh, the Potosi mountain began to be mined en masse in the 1550s and into the 17th century was the largest producing silver mine 
in the world, supplying some 60% of silver. This means that the silver from Potosi, from the same mine as this likely this silver we're looking at, is likely melted into other objects in the Baltimore Museum of Art collection by virtue of silver being melted down and re recrafted and recasted over time. I also thought it was important to take Baltimore's well-known uh, silver collection with a focus on Maryland silver and expand it to another continent um, in the Americas. So this is the largest and first substantial piece of silver we have from South America in the BMA collection. It's made at about the same time as our earliest piece of Maryland silver, which we see here on the right, which is dated about 1743. Excuse me, it's dated 1743 um, and made by John Inch, who was both a tavern owner as well as silversmith working and then um, uh, working in Annapolis. And that bowl was used as a trophy uh, for horse racing. And while our galleries are closed in that section today, uh, due to the pandemic, I encourage you to come look at our Woodlawn vase, generously on loan to the museum from the Maryland Jockey Society, which is the Preakness Trophy and made in 1860 by Tiffany's, um, and the, uh, wood, the Woodward Room, which also contains a history of horse trophies. But in thinking about America in the 18th century and what it meant, um, to be working in a colonial space, I like that we can have now a South American colonial object and a North American colonial object side by side. And I hope we'll continue to see that expansion of what broader America means uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries throughout our galleries. Because of course the Spanish colony, when this work was made, stretched from the tip of South America all the way up the west coast to Canada. So while we start in Maryland here, I think we'll see, as time moves forward, a movement to incorporate other colonizers' um, works of art in addition to our native population productions and craftsmanship in these early galleries. If you want to follow me to the next gallery, you are now about to experience the world premiere <laughs> of a newly installed uh, set of works. This room was formerly, or previous formerly, used to discuss classicism in America, something in which the Baltimore Museum of Art has a fantastic collection. Take, for example, this Klismos chair first, here on the right. Uh, this painted chair from circa 1820 is attributed to John and Hugh Finlay, uh, some of the, the most famous uh, furniture makers uh, of a pair of brothers. Um, some of the most famous furniture makers working out of the city of Baltimore. Um, the chair design, the Klismos chair, is based on a Grecian form. I always think it's interesting that the Finlays never, of course, saw a chair from Greece uh, in this form. Uh, there was none that existed for them to look at, certainly no museum to go to, and also very few examples. So the form of the chair is probably from them looking at images of them uh, and other furniture makers from this period looking at images of classical vases and the images on those vases and other um, pottery forms for ideas of perhaps if you can imagine in your head a woman sitting in profile on one of these chairs. So we have here an interpretation of a, a Greek and Roman form uh, painted with equally stylized uh, equally stylized ornamental scenes that harken back to an empirical past. And then, and that's been, that's been kind of the basis for, for thinking about North America, a newly free North America, a new republic, um, and that republic's interest in neoclassicism, so the revival of Greco-Roman ornamental and architectural forms which is excellent, and certainly one of, my, uh, one of my favorite periods in stylistic production. But one of the changes we've made recently, which you'll get to see in person when you come visit us, is to take that idea of empire 
and think not just about the newly founded 13 colonies expanding into states and becoming what we know today as an all-encompassing North American region um, and territorial empire, um, but to think about what other empires existed and also the consequences of those empires at the turn of the 19th century. On my left here, on my right, I'll stand this way, um, we have a portrait by Baltimore painter Philip Thomas Coe Tilliard. Tilliard has painted Jonathan Granville. Granville is a representative from the newly free Republic of Haiti. In 1804, the African population of the colonial, French colonial island Saint Domingue defeated their colonizers and founded what could be considered the first free black republic, free black republic in, the North, Amer in North America. Um, Granville was on a tour uh, where he visited Philadelphia, Boston, New York, and Baltimore um, to speak to citizens about emigrating, uh, to encourage free African American citizens to emigrate to Haiti. Um, and it's, a, it's about 6,000 people emigrated to Haiti um, in the wake of his visit. So Granville and Tilliard's portrait of him here represents a new republic, a different republic, very much located also in the North America, um, that we otherwise haven't spoken about in, 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 this, in this room dedicated to classicism and empire. We've placed the portrait of Granville next to this well-known form um, of a clock made by Jacques-Nicolas-Pierre-François de Buc. Uh, it's a mantle clock from circa 1815. And on the right, you can see a representation of George Washington. This clock was made after Washington had died, um, and so it's a, a sort of memorabilia. And on the inscription underneath the clock face, it reads, first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen, which champions Washington as a revolutionary general, politician, and that term, founding father. But this was very much only part of Washington's identity. And for those of you who live in the area, and more broadly, and hopefully have traveled and should, to Mount Vernon, uh, you'll know much more today about Washington's uh, role as an enslaver. Um, Washington's identity as an enslaver. Some over 500 people were owned, um, were owned by Washington in his lifetime and completed forced labor on his property. So instead of looking at this clock as friend, a French luxury object, which has been transported to America for a wealthy audience, um, many of whom probably were slaveholders themselves, um, we can instead look at this clock um, as the kind of conceit of empire. As um, George Washington, as someone whose political and military successes protected the rights of free, white, and land-holding men. And um, ignored, and certainly ignored, uh, in 1815, the type of oppression <laughs> that underlied uh, the idea of freedom in the United States. To gesture to that and to put that conversation together, we've put here, side by side, facing Washington, this abolition jug. I'm cheating a bit. This is probably from Staffordshire in the UK. It's probably made for export, both internally in the United States and for export to the United States. But this jug reads, am not I a man and a brother, and shows an enslaved man pointing to his chains next to the ocean. These abolitionist jugs were popular uh, in the United States by abolitionist groups. Maryland's Abolitionist Society was founded in 1789. And uh, these would have been sort of conversation starters, both at taverns, both in households. Their propaganda for the abolitionist movement, their presentations of a, um, a rising belief system that enslavement was inherently wrong. Um, in Maryland, too, we might look at Quaker communities, too, as a source of this, and we'll look at a John Needles piece of furniture in a second. Um, but on the other side of this jug, there's a poem. Uh, there's a poem 
depicted by William Copper. William Copper, a line in it says, slaves of gold whose sordid dealings tarnish all your boasted powers. And he's referring there the slaves of gold to the slave owners. And they're tarnishing all of their powers. And I like to think about the luster on the top of this, the copper glazed luster ware, as a representation of that gold that's being referred to in the poem. So it's tarnished gold, too, that they're, the, they're sort of slaves to gold, they've forgotten men, they've forgotten the humanity of the men around them. And so there's a little material connection there that, uh, that I think we can look at. But if we back up and look at these three objects in conversation then, too, we have a free black republic uh, founded in the early 19th century. We have an American empire that's established with only white land-holding men as those who are truly free. And we have here gestured a movement to release the black African descent uh, people who are still living in slavery in the early 1820s. And I hope that in our future acquisitions, we'll be able to show the work of free craftsmen that are working in this time period, free black craftsmen that are working in this time period, um, uh, as, well as, as well as the work of, of enslaved makers too. So stay tuned for that, I'm trying hard. This is also a really good time and a good wall to uh, give a little gesture of thanks uh, to you all at the Decorative Arts Trust um, for something that was formative for my training uh, to support the BMA collection. And that was a scholarship from the Decorative Arts Trust to attend the Program in New England Studies, PINES, which is run um, in, by Historic New England. And it's a uh, eight days on a bus <laughs> with scholars from uh, both Europe and the Americas uh, to study New England households. And we visited many homes from the 17th century all the way up through the early 19th century in the New England region. Uh, but for me, one of the most formative visits uh, was to Salem, Massachusetts, where I was able to see the work of Samuel McIntyre in context. Uh, so this chair for me, which has been wonderfully reupholstered uh, by predecessors uh, in curatorial and conservation here at the Baltimore Museum of Art, um, shows uh, this, this camel-backed sofa with its lovely rolling arms, shows the craftsmanship of master architect and furniture maker Samuel McIntyre, um, who was working in Salem, a massive trading city, much like Baltimore, uh, in the late 18th and early 19th century. Um, and I, I have to say that that trip inspired me constantly to think about the context of every piece in our collection, its atmospheric origin, and now how we might gesture towards that in our white walls of our museum institution. A couple more things to show you today, though, before we finish up and Carrie and I have a short conversation. Um, Want to pause for a quick moment on this uh, secretary bookcase, uh, which is by John Needles. John Needles is a furniture maker here from Maryland with a Quaker background, um, whose treatment and appreciation of the surface texture of various woods uh, is like honey, I think, uh, when we're looking at it. And so we can see on this work mahogany, rosewood, maple, um, we can see also underneath, uh, there was white pine, there's poplar, and there's also, for other materials here, uh, glass and brass knobs. Um, and it's, for me, just a symphony of various wood textures, um, a combination which is uh, bold, <laughs> to say the least, um, but the kind of thinness of his veneers, uh, that sort of expert uh, combining of various veneers to give us um, a kind of musical arrangement of, of various wood orientations um, and and textures uh, I think is is not to be not to be missed uh, when we're looking at uh, pieces of needle furniture. The BMA is very lucky. We have I think 15 pieces of furniture by needles in our collection, and he's an especially important. 
uh, cabinet maker to think about today too because he was a staunch abolitionist. Um, and if you have not heard some of the fantastic scholarship that's come out of Winterthur about his furniture, he would wrap, oh, it's a spoiler alert for other lectures, but he would wrap his furniture for his southern clients, his slave-holding, not just southern, but slave-holding clients, slave-owning clients, he would wrap it in abolitionist paper so that when the furniture arrived and was unwrapped, there was abolitionist propaganda that made its way uh, into households with enslaved persons inside. And I think uh, that uh, subterfuge and also um, tenacity um, and belief in that cause is a wonderful context too that must be highlighted more in our collections. Follow me this way. We're zipping past some favorites, and I appreciate your patience too as we really cherry pick um, what is a collection, uh, uh, a collection of, of true wonder. Um, and I, I remain ever grateful that I get to be a researcher uh, of these pieces. What is this plot here? Oh. I wanted to pause here to talk about just one, uh, one 20th century work. Uh, this is a, called the Whirlwind, or Tourbillon, but the Whirlwind Vase. Um, and up until late 2019, it was attributed to René Lalique, the French glassmaker. But um, through a little more research upon arrival, um, and due to a small exhibition in southern France, which focused not on René Lalique, but his daughter, Suzanne Lalique, we was able, I was able to reattribute this design for this piece of glass to Suzanne Lalique, so not her father, René, uh, who's better known. So this whirlwind vase designed by Suzanne Lalique was shown at the 1925 Paris Exposition, uh, and you can see, if we're thinking about 1925, machine age world, the, the capturing of the natural elements into abstracted forms. Uh, take a look at these deep inset uh, pressed glass uh, whirls that go around the vase and this, just the momentum, the physics of this piece are pretty uh, lively <laughs> in every way. Um, this comes in, in, in different uh, different enameled sort of surfaces on tops here. So we have uh, black outlines for our glass. But I wanted to talk about the 2020 Vision Initiative at the BMA. So last year, although interrupted by the pandemic, uh, we continued to acquire works and acquired over 40 new works by female identifying artists at the BMA. This is an initiative here that is supposed to and intended to reset um, are overemphasis on a male, male makers in the past. And so while we collected fantastic works by contemporary and historic female makers in 2020 and continue to make this uh, a point in our acquisitions, I feel pretty delighted that we're also able to find female makers in our midst. So by looking at our historic collection and asking questions like, hmm, is it just one male maker that created this work? Is it just the owner of the workshop that's getting the correct, uh, the attribution, that's getting the credit for production? Who else could have been there? Who else is present? Um, and so this is just one example and a named example. We're able to find a woman maker already around us. Uh, and I think she'll be, certainly will not be, uh, the, only, the only female artist to get her due uh, finally here at the BMA uh, after this recent initiative. Carrie, I think you and I want to walk in this direction then, and we will take a few minutes um, to sit and have a conversation. Thank you for bearing with us. We are on site here, and as you know, everything during COVID comes with its own complications. <laughs> so we've shifted to another wing of the museum, and 
and we are here to answer a few questions and wrap up what has been an amazing tour. Um, and I want to start off by giving Brittany the chance to tell us a bit about this awesome gallery and tell us uh, about where we are standing. Oh, Carrie, we are in the Willowbrook room right now, which is a period room. Uh, it's one of the few oval-shaped salons, so oval-shaped sort of living spaces. Um, in, early Mary, in early Maryland plantations, it's noted for its plaster work. So when you come to the BMA, do make sure that you look at the ceiling um, and you will see a variety of designs, perhaps by an Irish immigrant maker who do not know who did the plaster in this room. Um, but this room currently is being used to house a suite of silver, um, which is uh, one of the BMA's strengths. Um, and then the future will move and shift to include a much more um, contextual display, I think, about immigrant makers and immigration in early America. We are a country of immigrants. Um, and it will be identifying the various places that uh, people moved from and through the works that they created. Um, and it will also be looking at socialization um, in these plantation homes. Uh, in early Maryland, which of course we know included um, both the wealthy owners of the house and then enslaved and indentured people that lived in them. Amazing. And maintained the space. Um, and when you all come to Baltimore, I hope you're able to share this incredible room. I grew up coming here and adoring this space. So, um, uh, you're a relatively new curator and you've already done so much incredible work to add depth of research to the collection as well as new perspectives and I just wanted to hear a little bit more about what acquisitions you might be excited about pursuing. Oof! Um, the, I, I have to say I, I, it's an, an incredible honor to be in the lineage of experts um, that have uh, been the, the, you know, the stewards of the decorative arts in Maryland, uh, both for Maryland makers uh, from uh, and uh, as well as the expansion into the 20th and 21st centuries more recently too, um, both Maryland makers and, uh, and global, global uh, design. So I uh, have a, a broad purview um, and I work with the head of the Department of uh, American Art as well as the European Painting and Sculpture Curators as well as the contemporary curators uh, to chart ways in which functional art, the way that we move and handle three-dimensional uh, craft, uh, is displayed in the gallery. So some things I'm excited about uh, in the future. Um, I would love, oh, I'm going to give away all my good stuff. <laughs> I would love, love, love <laughs> to have a, a painted piece of furniture by one of the, the 19th century uh, schoolgirl women's, uh, so sort of women's tables or benches or boxes. We don't have that. And we have a, a, a multiple <laughs> suites of painted furniture and painted furniture is a uh, Baltimore specialty. Um, so I think a, a woman's painted furniture piece uh, comes to mind as a, a dream. Um, I, uh, one of my specialties is ceramics, and um, we, our collection of European ceramics is strong, but certainly early American ceramics are on my mind, uh, both from the South, from, from Maryland as well, and in mediums like stoneware and porcelain, um, and I'm grateful uh, that we have some, some good resources and also some very smart collectors here uh, in the region uh, that have generously lent <laughs> their expertise. Um, for contemporary design, which we did get a chance to look at today because we have a sort of limited gallery space open during the pandemic, but for contemporary design, it's heavy hitters in radical design uh, coming out of Europe. Uh, you, perhaps you'll see soon some work that thinks about furniture through the female body. Um, uh, so not furniture, as we know, it's sort of constructed in a, in a tradition of materials largely used by male cabinet maker, makers, but female designers thinking about what women need within, <laughs> with their curves, but the changing body of sort of maternal, uh, the maternal nature of, of being a woman, um, and sometimes. And, um, oof, some other good things. In, in European decorative arts, oh, I'm, I'm, 
those composite objects like we started this tour with. Those objects which have carved coconut shells and then those objects uh, which show the interconnected globe so visibly. Um, those things really excite me and I'd like, I'd like us to move and connect with other collections of the BMA Decorative Arts to partner with our you know, arts of uh, the Pacific Islands, for example, where there were trade routes from America. If we could show, uh, if we could show those trade routes through more works, I'd be, I'd be really intrigued uh, by where we could go with that. That's an incredibly <laughs> impressive list, and I hope that uh, some people listening may have some suggestions on how she can <laughs> build this already an incredible collection. Um, and uh, I also want to talk about the amazing G. Spen quilt exhibition that uh, we couldn't show today because it is currently being installed. But if you come to the BMA um, sometime soon, you'll be able to see it. Um, and can you tell me a little bit about that exhibition and what inspired it and what people can see in it? Absolutely. Um, opening later this year, please check the website artbma.org um, backslash exhibitions uh, for all date updates. But the um, G's Bend is a, a, in South Central Alabama, and it's a location of an independent craft evolution uh, in America, which are the G's Bend quilters. And this is uh, lineages of female makers quilting uh, in designs of their own invention uh, in this region. So we have um, some quilts that come out of G's Bend that are maybe known patterns that are practiced in other parts of America that come from pattern books. Um, but in G's Bend, the standard for what a good quilt is, or what the you know, excellent quilt might be, is how creative you are. How different is this quilt than any other quilt? Uh, so, so G's Bend quilts are, are for me quite exciting in that way because originality is at their core um, and they're very personal always. Um, but the exhibition focuses very specifically using five quilts acquired last year, focuses very specifically on 1965 and 1966 and the founding of the Freedom Quilting Bee, which is um, a, a female directed artistic coalition, a legal artistic coalition, um, and the quilters founded this bee um, as a way to monetize their production, and this was done in the wake of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Um, the quilters, prior to that Voting Rights Act, um, many of them were tear gassed, some were arrested, um, certainly discrimination was rampant, some lost their jobs in people's homes, the ferry to their town was cut off, um, these, these quilters suffered intense racial discrimination. Um, then, after the Voting Rights Act was passed, um, they decided to self-enfranchise. And so the Freedom Quilting Bee is very much a story about black female empowerment uh, in the South and through artistic production. And the works uh, in themselves become kind of wonderful statements of that um, in part. And, the exhibition was conceived uh, in 2020 in light of uh, George Floyd's murder and looking at protests across America um, and thinking about ways in which artists are responding to those. And I wanted, and the BMA wanted to, to, to contextualize a longer history of really proactive and successful artistic collaborations uh, founded under, under discriminatory practices. So there's, a, there's definitely a socio-political component to the show, and there's also this, this celebration of originality and female craftsmanship, um, and it'll be open, oh, I, I don't know if I can say April, maybe, <laughs> um, uh, of this year, please keep looking. And I will say that uh, the incredible depth and perspective that was in the analysis of the quilts is rich enough to come to see it and read about it and study it, but the quilts themselves I got to take a peek and see them behind paper <laughs> as they're being installed and they vibrate in the space and their the colors and the textures are worth coming to see in person if you can. Um, uh, so please come to check them out. It is definitely going to be an incredible show. Um, I also wanted to ask you about the reallocation of some of the gallery space at the yeah. BMA um, and sort of what your plans are for how the decorative arts are going to shift and fold as this 
museum continues to expand and change. Uh, don't tell my colleagues, but I would like the decorative arts to be in every single room um, in this in this museum. I think we too. So, um, the decorative arts. The, 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 when I say that, I am referring specifically to European and American-made objects. And then around post sixty, we we get into more global design uh, too, which which are artists uh, from from all the continents of the world. Um, but. Prior to my arrival and uh, my department's arrival, the American wing um, is installed, and this is mostly its current installation, is installed primarily with American painting and sculpture and decorative arts, but it also houses and has been the primary place of housing European decorative arts and contemporary decorative arts. And so what we'll be doing over the next several years, it's already in place, that's why we keep going to more European spaces, what we'll be doing over the next several months and years is moving the European made objects, so objects produced primarily on the content of Europe or owned by European um, makers, we'll be shifting those into galleries which are holistically, which are more materially holistic, I should say. Um, so our American wing, which will include more and more native, uh, native American works as well in the near future, um, you'll see works here as the, the premise of this space, the American wing we're in, as works made on this continent. Europe works made on that continent, much like our Asian galleries have works made on the Asian continent, our African galleries have works made on the African continent. Um, and then our contemporary wing becomes a whole conceptual, thematic um, set of rotations. And right now, that wing is functioning uh, based on theme, too. So it's a constantly rotating set of themes. So you'll see trophies, you'll see urns, you'll see glass, you'll see ceramics, you'll see furniture there in the future, um, which, which follows the craft and design movements um, all the way into yesterday and today. It sounds incredibly exciting and like a ton of work, so you definitely <laughs> have a lot to get back to. Um, and I want to thank you for being so generous with your time um, with this tour today. And is there uh, anything you would like to plug for our audience? Anything you're working on? Or I miss you as much as you miss the, the museum. Uh, art lives through conversation, it lives through dialogue. Um, coming to the museum is the way that we, we, we get out of our digital realms and we, we really get to breathe in the world um, with the history of, of creation. And um, I encourage you, even if you don't live in Baltimore, look at your local museum, find out what their opening program is. Uh, it occurred to me, uh, something I maybe already knew, but it became so real <laughs> during the first few months of, uh, for those of us who are not essential workers and stayed at home, became so clear to me that museums are vacations from home. <laughs> there are access to the world just a mile or two or an hour away from where we live. And so as our mission says, uh, we do everything through social equity and with artistic excellence to bring the world to Baltimore and Baltimore to the world. I hope you find your local world uh, near you and, and you're always welcome to come to the VMA. Oh, I can't think of a better way to say that. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this tour and you want to see more tours like it, uh, be sure to check out our YouTube page and please subscribe. Um, also, we have a panel discussion coming up later this month that's going to discuss um, the decorative arts market and we have some amazing leaders from different auction houses coming together to talk about how that market is continuing to evolve. So please check out uh, decorativeartstrust.org to find out more information on that. Thank you so much again. Um, and if you have any questions for Brittany, feel free, feel free to email them to me, carrie at decorativeartstrust.org and I will field them over to her. And I hope you all have a lovely day and